All right. So we're going to be talking today about age-related macular degeneration, one of the one of the most common uh, retina problems you're going to see here in your at the VA and here in the retina in the retina service. And this is going to be more or less an overview. Uh, I want this to be fairly informal. I'm going to chime in and see what and discuss what we're, what we're doing today. So, as always, and this is true in every grant that I, that I read and every paper that I read, review article that I always talk about, age-related macular generation is the leading cause of blindness in the developed world. And it, it truly is, but you know, the, it's, it's really, really uh, common. And it was, you know, thinking back 25 years ago when I was starting in this, it was a, it was a neglected problem. Now, it's, it's the focus of a lot of, of clinical practice, focus of drug companies. It's really, um, it's really changed dramatically. And with that change, we see, uh, we see a lot of interest. There's a lot of, in terms of research uh, funding, research interest, foundations, etc. There's a lot of interest in trying to get at this disease. And it's, it's changed from a disease that I would see, when I would see patients with age-related macular degeneration coming into my practice starting, there really wasn't much that I had to offer them in the 1990s when I was starting in practice here. It would range from uh, just telling them, well, you have age-related macular degeneration. If you have the wet form, the exudative form, you're, there's, there's not much we have to, there's not much we're gonna do for you beyond laser. That's gonna make your vision worse initially, but in the long term you're going to thank me, but they never did in the end. <laughs> and, um, you know, and dry age-related macular generation was even worse. We didn't have anything to offer. And we've, we've made a lot of progress on wet macular generation. We've not, we, and we'll go over that today. We haven't made as much progress as we'd like in dry, in, uh, dry age-related macular generation. But there's been a dramatic change in the way the patient attitudes and just in clinical practice. We see patients now, routinely, patients uh, that we see monthly com you know, coming in, so I get to know them very well as opposed to just seeing patients every six to 12 months and kind of moving them on. When I was starting in practice, the a AMD, I, li I liked taking on diseases that were not the common things that, you know, because we already had, when I was a resident, diabetes was understood in a lot of ways. We had at least laser that would work reasonably well. We knew other. We knew how to fix retina detachments. Of course, not as well as we do now, but AMD was a was a frontier, and that caught my interest from the start. And it was a disease that was relentless. So there was a lot of. I certainly had a lot of interest in prevention, trying to figure out how some of my background in nutritional biochemistry could be of use. And we'll cover kind of a little more detail on on some of the things that I know about in nutrition and in uh, a red study, which I was involved with. So just kind of going over the statistics, uh, depending on how, there's still just a lot of controversy in how you define AMD. Is it a few little drusen? Is it, um, is it <coughs> large soft drusen? Is it the advanced disease? What is really AMD? And <coughs> that has led the National Alliance to a lot of other, um, a lot of other, let me just, off for a second. Um, and that has led uh, a lot of other private foundation groups, etc., to try to define what AMD is. And we won't have time to go into the, the controversies involved in that and what, but basically, you know, we've learned that the very earliest stages of AMD may even be part of just normal aging, very small, small soft drusen are not considered high risk. It's the it's very large, very small hard drusen are, are not considered high risk. Large soft drusen, yeah, there, there's a lot of good epidemiology that has shown that that's important, <coughs> and certainly the advanced disease. So, depending on how you define it, you know, there are tens of millions of people in the U.S. Uh, that have at least the earliest stages of AMD. Intermediate AMD is is 7.3 million at least on this chart here. Advanced AMD is you know, somewhere in the in the couple million range, and there's a couple hundred thousand new new cases of advanced AMD that are happening every year, and it goes up with age. That's certainly one of the major risk factors for AMD. 
so that in the 50 to 60 year old range, you're going to be making the diagnosis of AMD in only about 1 or 2 percent of patients coming in. But as, it go, as, as the population ages and we have lots and lots of people that are in their 70s, 80s, 90s and beyond, about 30 percent of individuals have at least some form of age-related macular degeneration. And the numbers are roughly 10 or 15 percent are going to be in the exudative category of AMD. But 90, especially before we got anti-VEGF compounds, about 90 percent of blindness was uh, occurring in is, was caused by the wet forms of macular degeneration. And in this National Eye Institute uh, figure, this kind of just shows the exponential rise, both in men and women, as you, as you age here, and that it also emphasizes that this is a disease that's primarily of the Caucasian population. It's not, um, while African Americans and other more darkly pigmented people have less of the, um, have a, have a lower prevalence, prevalence consistently throughout, throughout aging. And I don't need to emphasize this is a disease of the central, loss of central vision. My patients coming in with advanced age-related macular degeneration have, are complaining about reading, driving, recognizing faces. They don't come in, uh, they don't come in with mobility problems except for the fact they can't drive. They're not running into things. They don't typically need other assistive devices. And we'll just kind of skip through some of these, but you know, they, and AMD comes in all sorts of all sorts of different flavors, whether in the dry form down below with Drusen, and eventually going to geographic atrophy, which looks at least pretty faded out on this picture. Or the exudative form where you can have just small hemorrhages, which is when you want to catch things early, and there's um, an early choroidal neovascularization versus these large submacular hemorrhages, which we can, which uh, cause much more vision loss and are a little more, more difficult to manage, and eventually advancing to uh, disc form type scars that you see here. The, and choroidal neovascularization is a very complex problem, and as you can see, there's a blood, the, the, the blood vessels grow underneath the retina, and whether you're getting type 1 or type 2 choroidal neovascularization, where you have either uh, neovascularization underneath the retina, uh, or underneath the retinal pigment epithelium, or between the RPE and the retina, this uh, growth of blood vessels, which I would say we still don't adequately understand what the stimuli are, this leads to a vision loss either from bleeding or or exudation and scarring that eventually can occur. And we don't want it to advance very, uh, very quickly. We know that this, by the time you get this sort of choroidal neovascularization, you want to suppress it. So through the years, we've had a lot of, um, a lot of diagnostic studies. And so just kind of, it's listed here, but I want to open it up to you. So when a patient comes in, they have AMD, what are they, what do they complain of? What do you do? And I'll start with Becca just right here. So it's pretty easy. So Yeah. Um, so, you know, you want to kind of assess the degree of visual impairment, um, you know, check vision and um, see what kind of uh, um, uh, scotoma or, you know, um, visual distortion they have using the Ampsler. So, so an Ampsler grid. And so hopefully at the VA when you're, when you're doing this, you actually get an Ampsler grid. I would say that, well, the techs here are pretty, are, Pretty remiss in doing that. I almost never get an Ampsler grid coming in with, a, you know, despite my request that they do it. They, it's a low tech thing. It's almost too low tech for them to do. But you want to see quantified. Do they have distortion? Um, if the patients do have distortion, or what can they do at home? You tell them, well, look at, look at door doorways, uh, look at blinds, something like that to see that. Um, are you familiar with the 4C device? Have you, which we sometimes have for our patients. Do you know about it? Anyone here? So there's, there is a, a way of, do, of quantifying the Ampsler grid, and you can do a computerized version that the patients have, and this is paid for by Medicare at about $20, and they, with a copay about $20 a month. But they get a device that they have at home. They look into it. It projects on a computer screen, a small computer screen, straight lines, which will look distorted to them, but it also will project distorted lines, which may look straight to them instead. And the machine projects all these different things. 
and the patients just click their what they see as straight and which, which is the more straight one. And then this is all communicated to a central reading center, that uh, computerized reading center that will then establish what is their baseline of distortion because they, they may have some baseline distortion, they may have some just uh, distortion that they always have. But if there's a change in distortion, it then sends a notice to them and to us and to me to come in sooner. <coughs> this has been uh, statistically proven in, re in, in prospective trials to pick up exudative macular degeneration often before they even have it. So it's an option. It's an option for patients who are very motivated, computer, somewhat computer savvy. So it's not for every patient <coughs> coming in. How long does it take to do it that? It takes five minutes probably. And we encourage them to do it. If they're doing it right, they do it. If they're motivated, they'll do it every day. They don't have to do it every hour or anything like that. But uh, some of them do it once a week. And I definitely have some patients coming in with, uh, with earlier than they normally would. On the other hand, it does generate false alarms, as you would expect. So you have to kind of, kind of balance that. So after, after you've noticed this distortion, what else are you going to do? Well, you're going to do a dilated eye examination after you've taken a visual acuity and just and a history of their new patients to you. And even before they have a dilated eye examination, they will already have an OCT. So you get, everyone gets an OCT these days. And um, you're going to be looking for changes. There's, as you can see here, let's see, I guess I can't show that. But um, you'll, see, does, you'll see either subretinal fluid, intraretinal fluid. You may see these subretinal hyper, hyperfluorescent material fibrotic scars, all sorts of things, but you're, you're all familiar with looking at OCTs and seeing that there's something different going on. And we, so you're going to get that, and as you can see, actually the 4C device is shown up on the top here, upper right, so that's kind of what it looks like through um, in this picture. And then, um, then we get fluorescein angiography. How often, when do you want, based on my practice and others' practices in your practice at the VA, how often do you get fluorescein angiography? Is it important to get now or no. not? Okay. <laughs> okay. No, and that's, a lot of people would argue that. I still, although it's less and less, I do, I do still get it in a lot, at least in the first presentation. But it's, it's, even though all of the studies, you know, the original Anchor, Marina, um, and even previous studies, those were all based on fluorescein angiography. Once OCT came in, it clearly is, is a way to, is the best way to follow, at least um, inexpensively, and to be, getting, to be getting serial examinations. But fluorescein angiography can help you distinguish between things that are going to be higher risk lesions, like uh, RAP lesions, um, and other ones that are not going to respond as well. And uh, sometimes you pick up things that are occult lesions that you really don't see on, on angiography. So I still will get them often, uh, but not, not always. And then ICG angiography is good for looking at, again, even more unusual lesions. So <coughs> don't forget to do it is basically the thing to do. So with past treatments of AMD, originally, as I said, in the 1990s, there was the macular photocoagulation study, the MPS study, which is of historical interest only. And that was, that's where at least we were trying to, the first steps were being made to try to shut down these, these vessels. And we would do argon laser, typically right to the fovea, is what it was recommended to do. That was proven through large uh, research studies that you would say, even though they had 2030 or 2040 vision, <coughs> You're better off ablating a very small vessel right in the center and then following them and, in the long, and if they don't have a recurrence, which unfortunately many of them did, they would be better in the long term than if you let them just grow and grow and have huge scars. Now I do have one patient in, <coughs> who I see monthly now who's getting treatment. I can remember her from 25 years ago where I, did, where I ablated her phobia. And that eye is still stable to this day, and she's 20, 70 in that eye, and is has and while the other eye was for came out came out in veg, anti vegf era, and I'm injecting that eye to keep it stable, so it did sort of work. 
wasn't great, but that was what we had back then. Then, as other things were starting, uh, Mano Swartz, who was on the faculty here, did, uh, was starting to do plasmapheresis. You know, he was kind of ahead of his time, realizing that complement factors might be important, and if you, can, if you can wash out all of these by doing plasmapheresis, you might be able to, to slow down the, stud, the progression of the disease. It worked a little bit. It was not a very good, uh, good, um, good uh, treatment. It was very expensive. It had risks to doing that. But um, statistically, there was a small, a small effect, but it wasn't statistically significant to do. Then there was a period around 2000 that surgical approaches got really popular. Vitreo, vitreo retinal surgery, surgery was getting to be very good. We, it was getting to be lower risk, and people said, well, why not reach underneath the retina, make a small retinotomy, and pull out the choroidal neovascular membrane? So, okay, what, what do you think, um, Brad, on that? What, was that good or bad to do? I, I, I assume it was pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> what it did is, why, why would it be bad? What was, what was going to happen? I mean, I think that there are many things. I mean, you're, first of all, you're making a retinotomy, so yeah. that in itself could lead to complications, detachment, and then, I mean, you're pulling out the choroidal neovascular membranes. You're still going to have that defect in Brooks. That doesn't get rid of that. So, I mean, I, I think it kind of puts a Band-Aid maybe on the problem, but then you're probably going to have so much submacular fluid after surgery um, that arises just from the trauma of just pulling out. Right, the so what comes out with it, if you think, when you're pulling on these choroidal neovascular membranes? Some of the choroid. Choroid, the RPE, all yeah. sorts of things. So you were left with not much there. So it was, you might as well just ablate it with laser and do the same thing. So, um, and you would also be putting patients at risk of surgical complications, taking an eye that was not going to, that was going to have a central scotoma and giving them a retina detachment or a massive subretinal hemorrhage. So that was one approach. The other surgical approach was to actually do macular translocation to either detach the retina with a large 360-degree uh, uh, giant tear and move it to another area or to do scleral imbrication but try to move it else it elsewhere and what happened is not only did that have horrible surgical complications potentially but also the choroidal neovascularization would just move over there so there was something about the fovea that was actually that was uh, encouraging it to be to form choroidal neovascularization so that that didn't work very well um, other other things that were tried were external radiation uh, using uh, various ways and that is an anti-angiogenic uh, means of doing it. It had significant complications because eventually you would get radiation retinopathy and other problems like that. Uh, they were, it's been tried in various ways but it never really caught on. And then the first, the first treatment that finally kind of at least was changing the natural history of the disease, not, not dramatically but was better, was photodynamic therapy. And you'll still see us occasionally doing that. So photodynamic therapy is, involves giving a photosensitizing dye intravenously and then, and then treating it with, a, with a, a low power infrared laser, a red or infrared laser that would help close down the blood vessels. This worked well in animal models. It worked um, reasonably well in humans, but it tended to generate kind of a fibrotic, a slow fibrotic scar. <coughs> needed retreatments, but when it first came out, it was common. Basically, I would, if, right now, if you ever see me doing PDT, which, what do we do, what do we use it for now? Anyone know? CSCR. CSCR, it's very good for. If you had a choroidal hemangioma, which is really rare, that would be the other, other reasons. Occasionally for, um, for <coughs> recalcitrant AMD, we will do, we will use it, but the problems with this is also the photosensitization. When we were doing the original trials, this was one of the first trials I was ever involved with, was, a, was with the Miravant drug. Uh, and that one it required that the patient stay out of the sun for 30 days afterwards. Otherwise, they would get a sunburn. So that, that the newest, the one that we use now, vertiporphrin, uses just, they have to stay out of the sun for three days for sun sensitization. So, it works 
reasonably well, but it's not great. And it wasn't, and then, and that lasted, that era of photodynamic therapy where I would do six or seven of these on a surgery day in between cases has gone away. We do one a month, but you should see, when we do them, you should see how it's done. But the main thing that, the big thing that changed was uh, the anti-VEGF era. And you've had a lot of drug, uh, I'm not gonna go into the basic biochemistry of this, but we learned that Vascular endothelial growth factor, which is involved in diabetic uh, neovascularization and is also involved in choroidal neovascularization. And that VEGF, very surprisingly <coughs> to me, turned out to be the choke point, that you could really attack one, even though choroidal neovascularization has a lot of different causes, you could go after a single, uh, a single point in the neovascularization uh, biochemical pathway and knock things down very well. And the original, uh, the original anti-VEGF drug was Macugen. And does anyone know about Macugen at all or what, or what was different about it? So Mac Macugen was an aptamer, so it was not an antibody. And they, they targeted VEGF, they really targeted just the VEGF-A isoform, just one, one isoform, and they marketed it as being the best way you're going to really target things. But they got a little too narrow in what they were going after. And it changed the natural history, but it didn't, it didn't cause vision improvement. So it wasn't as good as the next generation compounds, which were Avast and Lucentis, and all the other ones that are, that are antibody-based, and have a little broader uh, attack on the various forms of, of, of VEGF. And so Macogen originally was given every six weeks. It had it had its, its time of about 18 months on the market, and that was it, before it was realized that uh, the other compounds were better. Uh, Lucentis is the one that Genentech put its big money on, into, and may, they made it specifically targeted for the eye, went through the process, and uh, Phil Rosenfeld, who was one of my residents when I was a fellow, realized that uh, he, that you could just use Avastin. They're, the, the intravenous form that did the same thing. And that kind of messed up uh, everything for Genentech in terms of their uh, marketing, <coughs> et cetera. And as you know, Avastin still works pretty good. It's gone through the trials, like the CAT trial, that's shown in general that it, it is just as effective as the more expensive compound. And so that's still controversy to this day in terms of which, which should be the first line treatment. We're not even consistent here at the Moran, what's the first line treatment? Is it is it Avastin or is it uh, is it Ilea or the newer ones uh, like Ilea? And then we're going to have B of U is going to be coming out within months. And so we it a lot depends on insurers. It depends on physician preference what you do. Um, but they all they all are fairly close. I personally generally don't use Avastin. I tend to either I tend to use Ilea right now as my first line treatment as long as it's allowed, but uh, Avastin, if there's payment issues, if there's something very atypical, if I'm using it more off-label is what I use, but you'll see, you'll see differences, there is no right answer. In private practice, for a long time, Avastin was the cheaper way to go. I think it's actually getting more difficult to use now, so many, and, and availability is getting more difficult. So <coughs> some of the more on-label ones are the ones that are being used now. With B of U, the one that will be coming out within the next months, it's basically being marketed as something that, that has longer acting and is a more, mm -hmm. has a higher affinity. So that's the one that, that we may be using. And they're all priced to be very expensive. <laughs> so we need to make things better. As you see in our practices the, and at the VA, these patients keep coming back month after month. Uh, with recurrences, with need, you know, being needing maintenance, and so we need to improve a some sort of drug delivery and durability, and that's what you'll see in some of the clinical trials that are being presented and that we're involved with. Uh, through the years, people have tried topical, trying to do topical anti-angiogenic uh, compounds. The problem is you can get it to work maybe in a mouse with a little tiny eye or a rat, but a human eye is pretty big, and what you put on the on the surface. It's just not enough of that is going to get back uh, to the back of the eye. Um, we've, people have been working on erodible implants. Uh, they've been working on refillable reservoirs. That's, that's the hot new thing from Genentech is their uh, 
their reservoirs the problem is with with any sort of reservoir you have to you have to refill it it's a potential site site for uh, for endophthalmitis for infection coming in you may also get uh, you may also get you get vitreous hemorrhage when you're doing a surgical surgical implant and it it's probably going to be ridiculously expensive once it comes out so it will be that's but that's the future of what's coming next and then people have tried systemic but that generally hasn't worked very well because angiogenesis is very important to a lot of other parts of your body so mm -hmm. how are you going to target it directly to the eye obviously if we can just inject it in the eye or keep it, or focus it specifically there so just to kind of summarize in terms of other things that have come and gone really the next generation treatments people have tried you know, it, as with chemo, cancer chemotherapy, you think, well, let's work on multiple pathways and shut this down. And so that seemed like a good idea. And there were, um, there were, there, we were involved in the trial with Fovista, which is an anti-PDGF compound, which is another, uh, another part of the pathways of angiogenesis. And they made a big deal that this is going to work by putting this all together, the, uh, by, by attacking multiple pathways. In the end, it didn't, it didn't make any difference. Um, so the, they had a big trial. That didn't go very far. Um, there have been DARPINs, which is another form of anti-VEGF made by Allergan. And we've been part of that trial. And it's been shown to, at least the results that I've seen, it have been shown that it works as well. The problem is about 20% of people get significant uveitis from the, com from the compound. We, own, we enrolled exactly one patient, and he got uveitis within, within three months. And so he's, um, so I don't think it's going to get approved. I don't think it will get to market. It just, there are too many other good compounds out there, and the, the side effects, the side effect profile was really pretty bad. Um, other compounds that have come and gone include squalamine, which is a topical anti-angiogenic. That one is, that one never worked very well and focal irradiation. As I talked about that, they even developed this whole kind of st almost stereotactic way of, 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 of delivering radiation. That's shown down below with that, with that chair there. Other, another trial that we weren't involved with involved taking a little strontium-90 source at the end of a probe that you would, that you would uh, do a vitrectomy and hold over the macula for about two minutes to irradiate the macula. Again, that, that didn't go very far. So uh, just this is Fovista, which uh, they spent a lot of money in it. <coughs> That's that one. Now we'll talk about dry macular degeneration. So the, that's kind of the new frontier. And there's a lot of different things that have been tried through the years. And they range from growth factor implants, including the uh, Neurotech implant, where they had uh, transformed RPE cells that secrete uh, CNTF. We tried that for um, we tried that for AMD. RP failed. What's the one what's the one positive that they've had? Anyone know? What uh, what condition? MacTel. That's the one that it did. Actually, in phase two, show that it did slow down the disease. We're part of the phase three trial. So you will see these implants. We're up to about ten. We're the leading center for enrollment certainly in the in the in the west of the western United States and I think will soon be for the world soon because we have a lot of patients and so this will uh, this trial will close enrollment uh, within the next month or two it's going to close at the end of at the end of December and we'll have the readout within a year or two why it works for MacTel I don't know and we will find out if, if it does work other things that we've been involved with through the years include anti-amyloid beta, uh, complement inhibitors, visual cycle modulators, neuroprotective factors, antioxidants. We're trying to, but why is dry AMD so much, why did it turn out to be so much more difficult than wet AMD? Any, any thoughts, Teresa? Well, it just, it really, you think about wet AMD, it, patients are coming in early, or coming in, they've had a, a two week, vision loss, and you're injecting a compound, and you can actually, you can see the difference, right? You can see it, and I can tell it in the clinical trials when we finally got, uh, when I first started using Lucentis in clinical trials, 
I didn't know who was being treated or not, but I could tell the difference. I could see, I knew something was happening in changing the natural history. What's going to change the natural history of dry AMD, geographic atrophy, that you're going to notice? It's going to be hard because we're looking at growth, slow, relentless growth of a, of a central area. You can see it maybe over two years, but you're not going to see it over a period of a couple of weeks. So that's, that's one of the big challenges that we'll talk about. Probably the most promising uh, dry AMD approaches right now, at least, uh, seem to be the ones in, involved in the complement cascade. So we've known that, ant that complement is involved in AMD. It's known from genetic studies. But, um, and it's a very complicated pathway. And so from the start, when Greg Hageman and others uh, identified that complement was going to be a, a good target, the, uh, the drug companies went, started looking into this, and they had lots of inhibitors, both uh, from the eye, eye standpoint and from, um, and from immunology. And a lot of them failed initially, and especially uh, lapalizumab, the one that from Genentech shown up on the right. That one has not, that one they spent, I think it was $300 million is what I've heard. Yeah, it's, they got a completely negative study in the end. They had some promising, they were very, they were unusually optimistic with their kind of not very good phase two results that they, but that were positive after they did post hoc analyses. They put huge amounts of money into it and it failed completely once they had to do the full phase three trial. But interestingly, both APL1, which is made by Apellus, and Echolizimura, which is made, they, they changed the name of the company again, but that was originally Ophthotech, I, I can't remember the name again, the new one. Both of them have announced, both in the, in the last year or two, positive phase two trials for slowing <coughs> the growth of geographic atrophy in AMD. So they're both gonna put the big money in, the hundreds of millions of dollars to do phase three trials. We're part of the phase three trial for APL2, and uh, yeah, yes? What yep. kind of time you need in a, these trials to show slowing in dry AMD. Like how many? Tw a minimum 12 months, generally 18 months, occasionally 24 months. So it's in that range. One to two years is what you're what you're looking at, and you're trying to get. They 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 seem to be looking for about a 20 or 25 percent reduction in the growth rate. So that's that's what they see right now. Now. Um, do you have to, does anyone know what is the side effect that I think that I've seen in both of these trials? And well, the main thing is they seem to be in, uh, in they seem to be stimulating coronal neovascularization. So they're doing something not necessarily good, not necessarily good in the long term. Is that, yeah. Yeah. yes, these injectables, both of them there's an increased rate of choroidal neovascularization. I just saw this. They don't play it up on the Zymura stuff, but it's, it's there. It takes it from about <laughs> two or three percent rate of choroidal neovascularization to eight to ten. So it it's a significant change. the The good news, and when I see that, is it tells you that this really is changing a biochemical pathway. Something is happening, and they kind of they say, well, you just do injections for the wet AMD. So now you're giving uh, Zymura requires two injections in, within 30 minutes to do this, of 100 microliters. It's huge. And it, so, it's, so now you're talking about multiple injections into the eye. I have one patient who's, when she gets it, needs a paracentesis after each one. So you're sticking the needle in her eye. Uh, she's getting it for, for Stargirl right now in the, in the trial. So it's, it's a big problem. So that Right now, I think that's got the most potential. We'll see how it, how it plays out. But this is just a slide I made a year or two ago that just shows how many different drugs have been tried, how many different pathways have been, have been, uh, have been looked at, and most of these are failures. So it's, but they're looking for the big payoff. Why is it a challenging target? Well, because we don't know exactly what we're treating. We don't completely understand the genetics we don't understand inflammation and oxidative stress, the roles of inflammation, oxidative stress, amyloid, lipofusin. We discussed it's a slow disease, and you don't have any good animal models to show this. 
And then finally, and this we can discuss this here, what are what are you going to use as your endpoint? Is right now everyone uses almost every trial uses growth of geographic atrophy. Is that really a good thing? What what's wrong with that? Well, it doesn't really um, it doesn't show you the impact on the patient and right. you know kind of what do they notice? Yep, that's definitely a problem. Another thing is geographic atrophy is really late in the disease and some people will argue one, by the time you've got a significant area of geographic atrophy enough to follow in a clinical trial, you know, it's, you should have been treated five, ten years ago. You know, it's just, those cells are destined to die already on the edges. It's going to just keep growing. Can you really modify, modify the natural history at that point? So that, that I think, is a, is a big problem. But that's the best way that we look at. I think OCT is going to be another way that people are looking at it. Maybe we'll be able to look at things earlier as OCT gets more and more high resolution and we get better ways of analyzing it. That's coming into a lot of clinical trials. Visual acuity is terrible. That's not going to be the way to go. FDA has finally realized that that's not going to be part of the way we do trials. And uh, color photographs are probably are not going to be as good as, as some of the others, but it's going to be still I think structural OCT and autofluorescence. So that's what we have now. In terms of the new frontiers, uh, we know that AMD has major genetic component, about 50% of it. It could be ABCA4 was the original one where we at least thought we might have a genetic basis of AMD. It turned out that complement factor H, HTRA1, HTRA1 ARMS2 are really the major two genetic risk factors. Um, and, and Greg Hageman here is trying to develop trials and targeted to actually look to identify people who have, have the highest risk genotypes, target those, target that for particular form, chromosome 10 uh, versus chromosome 1 AMD, to be treated differently. And I think there's probably something to that. Um, there have been a lot of genome wide association studies that have shown that there are beyond the, the couple that I've shown here, that there are probably 15 or 20 risk factors, but they all are 10% risk, you know, in, increase your risk by 1.1 uh, relative risk, and it's very, very small changes that you're going to be seeing. Um, and then there still is the question, should you be genetically testing patients in the first place when they're young and healthy to try to identify whether they would be, um, whether they should be doing any any interventions early on. And then the other thing that's happening soon are gene therapies are coming not only to try to alter the complement pathways, but also people are trying to deliver the anti-angiogenics, uh, you know, deliver various anti-angiogenics by gene therapy. The problem, the good news is that would be a one time and you're done. The problem is you can't control anything. Once you've treated them, there's no turning back, as there is if you just stop the injections or take out your reservoir. But uh, people, why do people like gene therapy? Well, we know the price of gene therapy is a half million dollars an eye for, for RP, and so they can price it very high through this. So we, um, there's, gene, currently we don't recommend pre-symptomatic uh, testing for, for AMD. I'm going to be writing a clinical trial of trying to look at whether that really is important and uh, if people do make lifestyle changes. So there's still, I think, a future in this, as, especially as, gene ther as genetic <coughs> testing comes down in price. It's only a couple hundred dollars. People who are getting 23andMe and various other gene therapies are already starting to see that they come back with, that they are at, quotes, elevated risk of developing AMD. And that, that uh, and then you're there, you're going to see more and more of those patients coming in VA and in the clinics. But we need to prove that they actually are useful. And then restorative treatments like stem cells are coming down the line. The patients are, are well aware of them, but as we all know, stem cells are higher risk than any benefit that we have right now. But that can change over the next five to ten years. And artificial vision is important. Uh, or, has, or is at least an important option. We tried the intraocular telescope. I don't know if, have any of you ever seen any patients with that? You have? I think it was your patient. Don't you have one with it? I have one or two, and you know what? I've never seen them since it was there. So oh, maybe you it may have seen them in cornea clinic, but that's what I found very disappointing. I found, 
it was a, d a device that would essentially magnify, it was an implant that was put in during cataract surgery and it magnified the, res um, the, the image on the retina. I'd send them off to cornea clinic, to the cornea people who did it, and I never saw the patients back again. I literally have never seen a patient with this implanted in. And so I stopped referring them because I wasn't really getting any positive results. So they cost about five or $10,000 for that implant. The artificial, um, the chip implant that we use for RP, uh, the Argus II, people, they were looking at it for AMD, and it's been totally pulled off the market now because they couldn't, they couldn't, could not justify the hundred thousand dollars that uh, that it went in that it required to be put in. They're looking at cortical implants, but cortical implants are never going to be good for AMD. The patients, I would never recommend that. Why? So, what? Why? For AMD? Yeah. Because the, the resolution is so poor. So poor. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, we have to look at low vision services. Uh, just remember, we have a lot of. Um, we have a lot of options for patients here, and it, it is important to use our low, our, our low vision services. And then, of course, my patients especially come in with all sorts of other uh, complementary and traditional medicine. They they ask about electrostimulation. There were people up in uh, in this town who were doing acupuncture for dry AMD that are taking bas basically the patient's monies money for that. So in the last 10 minutes, I'll talk a little bit about the ARED study. So we've got all these treatments for AMD. Some work, some don't. How do we prevent AMD? Well, it's important to identify risk factors and modify those that you can. As you know, age, heredity, gender, pigment, there's not much we're going to do about changing that for, for patients. But through the years, through epidemiology, we've identified we know that smoking is a huge risk factor for AMD. Uh, always recommend that they don't smoke. We don't have, here in Utah, the smoking rate is not high. The VA, it's, it's higher, and you do need to counsel the patients and get them to stop smoking. Uh, changing, the, trying to alter various risk factors for cardiovascular disease, always good for the patient and for AMD. And uh, alcohol consumption has been variable in terms of whether it's a risk factor. Certainly, alcohol in excess is not good. It may be in low amounts, there's at least some epidemiology that alcohol consumption may be mildly protective. We know that light exposure is a risk factor, but in only extreme cases. So you're talking about uh, farmers, you're talking about uh, fishermen, people who are out all day, every day in bright sunlight. It's been shown in epidemiology studies. They have a higher rate of AMD if they don't use uh, sun protection. For those of us that live in, in uh, fluorescent lights, look at blue screens, it's not really clear whether that's a risk factor or not. And I, through the years, I've been working a lot on nutrition and AMD. We know that the retina and the RPE are a region of highly unsaturated lipids that are susceptible to oxidative stress. And, um, the, and with and antioxidant, nutrition is the main way that we get antioxidants. But these are going to be difficult studies to perform because you know, you're living with free living humans. They have, they eat, they eat a lot of nutrients. How do you know that a nutrient is going to be protective against AMD? Patients want to know. Here in Utah, they want to take supplements, but how do we give them good guidance? So, in terms of identifying nutritional factors for AMD, the first step is in the past has always been epidemiology, just looking at associations, doing large studies that are going to involve hundreds or thousands of patients, looking at who gets AMD and who doesn't, essentially case control studies, doing nutritional surveys, doing blood levels of various nutrients, and trying to figure out, trying to tease out which ones would be important. And we'll talk a little bit about those in a second. Um, animal studies are important, but we don't have good animal models for AMD. And then, of course, you want to do physiology. If you're going to talk about nutrients, you have to, you know, the nutrients need to be getting into the eye, they need to be actually doing something there. So that's what I do in my basic science laboratory, is trying to figure out what nutrients help. And then, of course, there are going to be prospective trials in the end. So through epidemiology, this is the list of the ones that have come up most commonly. Uh, zinc uh, came up, actually, 
early in epidemiology, the original prospective zinc studies were, were done here at the University of Utah by Mano Swartz. Um, but, and, and this was eventually tested in the AREDS 2 study and came out positive, as we'll see, in the AREDS 1 study. Antioxidant vitamins like vitamin C, E, and A are commonly used. Uh, DHA is thought to be very important because it's specifically concentrated in the eye and it's important for structure of the retina and keeping it, uh, keeping it healthy, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the carotenoids, lutein and zeaxanthin, which I've been studying for decades, are specifically concentrated as the macular pigment of the eye. And then, if, then my patients are always bringing in new things like bilberry and polyphenols that are not adequately studied. So right now, the, the, <coughs> main, uh, the mainstay of our nutritional recommendations are still based on uh, large clinical studies like the AREDS-1 study. This was going on uh, when I was a fellow in the early 1990s. I w uh, was being, Mass Eye Near was one of the sites. I would see a, a number of the patients coming through. But this was based on the nutritional uh, knowledge of the 1980s, basically. And they chose the be what they thought would be the best antioxidant uh, combination. It was a large study. This is to show what you really need to do to get clinical recommendations. You have to have nearly 5,000 subjects. You need to pick them at the right age, and you need to follow them for five years. AMD, especially early AMD, is a, is a slow disease. And they were randomized to antioxidants and supplements, and they looked at the incidence of cataracts and severe vision loss. They had to devise a grading scale. This was one of the early grading scales for AMD, and they, they ranged from one and two, which are, well, especially one, which was just a few small drusen, which they effectively established through their natural history study, is, is essentially not AMD. That's normal aging. Then they found early AMD at age two, or uh, at grade two, which are non-extensive small and intermediate drusen, good acuity. Then, eight, but they really needed, they learned that they need to focus on high risk patients, the ones who have uh, true intermediate AMD with uh, soft drusen, early atrophy, pigmentary changes, or to look at patients who are really high risk in that they'd already lost one eye to advanced AMD and you wanted to slow that down for those patients. So their original formulation was zinc oxide at pretty high levels. This came from Mano Swartz, uh, Swartz and Newsom study here. Um, the, they had to put copper in there because that dose of zinc would cause anemia, so they had to put in a little bit of copper. They did uh, reasonable doses of vitamin C and vitamin E, and they did 15 milligrams of beta carotene, basically because it was a precursor for vitamin A, and that's what they had. That was the carotenoid that they had. What was the problem? What, does anyone know what the problem was of uh, having beta carotene in there? Smokers, lung, cancer. lung cancer. Yeah, lung cancer, and that came out in the middle of the study, that uh, not in, not so much for that study, but there were some other studies that came out at the same time that that, that giving so much of a single antioxidant uh, might be a problem. Anyway, they found that this was a very important study and that they did find that there was a positive uh, result of taking these combinations, especially the, the full combination of zinc and antioxidants and that it reduced the risk of progression to advanced, uh, to severe vision loss and advanced AMD by about 25%. Not a huge effect, it takes long term, but when you're talking about millions of people at risk, this is, and, and we had at least some good, uh, a good, relatively low cost, low risk intervention, except for the beta carotene, this was, um, this seemed to be, this was a major advance. They thought it might work for cataracts, that didn't work at all in this study, at least in the US population and it really had to do with progression to advanced AMD, primarily to exudative AMD rather than geographic atrophy. So they, this was published in 2001, and the AREDS-1 uh, formulation was, rapidly became the standard of care. That's what we did, and it's still AREDS-1, if you, if, unless you've told me any differently, is still what the VA does, is that correct? They're like the only people that never moved to AREDS, too. Oh, they have no, both. They have, they have you have, you have to have claim they're smokers? It's a non formulary. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just yeah. claim everyone's a smoker. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's, it's a yes. non formulary, but it's built in, and you just choose which. <laughs> which, which but it's still strange that they, they do that. 
I've never had a Anyway, um, yeah. in the last couple of minutes, I'll talk about lutein and zeaxanthin, no, they form the macular pigment. I've been fascinated why they are concentrated in the retina, and we get them from dark green leafy vegetables, and they act as antioxidants and light screening compounds. So this is, as opposed to beta carotene, these are naturally found in the eye as, as the actual molecule. So the, once we had AREDS-1, the data for, a, for lutein and zeaxanthin was much better known. And also, in the 1990s, when I was doing some of my fellowship with Joanna Seddon, this work was just coming out that epidemiology that truly, that dietary consumption of lutein and zeaxanthin, especially at the high ranges of six milligrams per day that a, that a vegetarian might be consuming, that was a, that could reduce the risk of advanced AMD by about, uh, by about 50%. So it was really a pretty interesting finding. And based on that, the AREDS-2 study was formulated to try to get the beta carotene out and to see if lutein and zeaxanthin would be a good addition. And they chose 10 milligrams of lutein a day and two, and two milligrams of zeaxanthin, which is a, what a very high dose, what a vegetarian might be consuming. And it turned out that's a pretty reasonable dose uh, to be given. And there's not many, there are not many known side effects. I've only, I've published actually the only, uh, morbidity of taking very high doses of lutein and zeaxanthin, which is crystallization in the retina. Those patients were typically taking double this dose and having a huge amount in their diet and not having AMD or something else. And then rarely, rarely will you see crystals forming in the retina. The other thing they wanted to study were omega-3 fatty acids and at a dose of one gram per day, that was thought to be a reasonable dose uh, to be taken equivalent to a couple servings of fish a week. And they uh, evaluated uh, AMD progression, cognitive function, et cetera. And we enrolled about 60 subjects of the 5,000 subjects, or 4,000, and we announced the results in 2013. You can see this was a nationwide study, and they picked patients with large drusen, GA, and neovascular zap, and GA, or neovascularization, in, in the other, in the fellow eye. And unfortunately, they had, they started with a very simple design of uh, de looking at the top row here, lutein and zeaxanthin, DPA and EGA, DHA, and them together. But then they started subdividing everything into various different formulations of, uh, of the AREDs with or without, uh, with, with or without beta carotene or with or, with or without high, low, high and low zinc and made it ridiculously complicated so that no one quite understood exactly what we were doing. But in the end, the results were not overwhelming. Uh, we did see that adding lutein and zeaxanthin decreased some of the progression to, uh, to advanced AMD. That was statistically significant, but it did not reach the primary endpoint. So when we published the, the article on this, we had to publish it as a completely negative study in JAMA, that it did not reach its endpoint. The, and even worse is that uh, EPA and DHA actually did nothing in this study, probably because the patients were so nutritionally aware coming in and ate too much fish even coming into the study. But, so I said we had to report it as a negative study, but we then came out within a year of a secondary analysis that showed that if you take out the beta carotene and, and replace it with lutein and zeaxanthin, that you could slow down the disease statistically significant. And this became the standard of care very quickly because we really wanted to get the beta carotene out. Because even in this study, we didn't allow the smokers to take beta carotene, but the past smokers could. And even the past smokers had higher rates of lung cancer statistically in this study. So, yeah, did you have a question? What was the primary endpoint? The primary endpoint was the way it was whether lutein was whether lutein and zeaxanth whether any of the active groups were better than controlled by 25 percent, so you already had an effective uh, an effective treatment, but you had to get it. We had to have a very a, a strong Im increment over an already effective treatment, and there could have been other ways that they set up the uh, the the groups, and I can get into the subtleties of that sometime with you, but it just, 
in the end, you have, whenever you set up a study initially, you have to, the FDA requires you to say, this is the primary endpoint and I'm not going to change anything beyond that. And they picked the wrong one, basically, that close. But we still changed it and put in, uh, and we found that lutein and zeaxanthin did not increase risk of lung cancer. So it became very, it, it became that uh, the, that lutein and zeaxanthin was considered a good way to improve the safety by removing beta carotene and putting in lutein and zeaxanthin. And that's what's shown here. These are some of the original ARID slides that we were presenting. And so in the end, the ARIDS 2 formulation, which is generally the standard of care, is take out the beta carotene, add lutein and zeaxanthin, and don't, um, and don't put in omega-3 omega fatty acids. Although I strongly encourage my patients to consume fish several times a week, and if they don't, then, uh, then they can take the supplements. So I still at least do that kind of off-label. And so in the end, what do I tell my patients still, especially if they're the worried well, the patients who are coming in, the children of the patients coming in, who ask, well, should I be taking the same supplements that you're giving my, my parents here? The bottom line, if they're still in their 40s and have a, to a totally normal eye examination, I still say, work on your diet, at, at least initially. Don't take high-dose supplements. Uh, so eat a healthy diet, lots of fruits and vegetables and fish, and ARIDS 2 is really for the patient, patients who fit into the high-risk categories. At least that's what I say in my practice. Um, other supplements are still coming down the line. There's mesozeaxanthin. There's all sorts of subtle things that I can talk on. And people are looking at coenzyme Q and everything else. But right now, we just don't have enough data to go forward um, to make any recommendations. Clearly, alcohol should be, if it's being used, should be used in moderation. Don't smoke. Avoid excessive light exposure. And I always just thank my patients to, to participate in clinical trials. We have, right now, there will pro even, will there be an ARIDS 3? Probably not. I think ARIDS 2 w works pretty well. It, these were very, very expensive studies. We're talking about tens of millions of dollars minimum for the, to do each of these studies. And it's going to come down to the drug com to the supplement companies. And because supplements don't require going through full FDA trials or anything else, they just don't bother. They, they approach me, they want to do kind of poorly designed studies and say, can you, can I try this supplement and, you know, can you t give me the results in, in six months on 40 patients to prove it works? And it's just like, it's not going to happen that way. So in terms of what I'm doing nutritionally right now is I'm looking at more subtle, more focused questions and actually as you'll see in my clinic, and you'll see here, I'm do, I've actually switched to early in the lifespan now. I'm, we're doing studies on pregnant women, uh, looking at supplementation of lutein and zeaxanthin, whether that prevents some of the depletion that occurs probably during pregnancy, and whether that can improve uh, macular pigment and visual function eventually in their children. So I've got, I got uh, significant funding from the National, National Institute of Health, and we're, we've recruited in our first month that we've been open, we've recruited seven pregnant women. We only need 60, so we're, we're on track for all this. So. Anyway, that's, I think, everything here. And just of those, you can see that's the original Moran, the way it looked when I first came here, when it, before it was surrounded by all the buildings, before the Huntsman Cancer Institute. <laughs> it looked kind of idyllic, sitting there against the mountains. And then they built all the buildings around it, and we had to move. So, all right. Any questions at all?